So we've got a financial planner, an accountant, and a lawyer in the room. So there are all three aspects when it comes to superannuation, um, and it is important to sort of work with all three disciplines to really understand superannuation, especially if you are in the stage where you're getting to, you know, phasing into retirement, for example. So we'd like to kick this off, and Doug's going to go first and run you through what is super and the ins and outs, and, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll run through, I guess, about 15 slides. It's not the prettiest presentation. It's more done to remind me to talk about certain things. Uh, apologies if it's a bit rusty. It's been a couple of years since I've done a superannuation presentation, but I do talk about it every day, so I think we should be fine. Um, importantly, it's a broad overview, and even just chatting with Claire this morning, you start to go down rabbit holes. Like it actually does get quite complex depending on um, personal circumstances. So we'll try to keep it, um, you know, at a relatively high level of just a broad overview. But if there are things that you say, "Oh, I'd like to know more about that," then we'll be around afterwards. Or by all means, just interrupt at any stage. Just put your hand up, or just type up a small group. So um, feel free to jump in and, and just ask for a bit more information on something. Um, every presentation we do have to have a general advice warning. So it's just saying that anything we're talking about today is just general in nature. It's not tailored to your personal circumstances. So we're not recommending you run out and do something. Um, so that's general advice. Um, to start off with, you know, what, what is superannuation? I gather we all have some concept of roughly what it is. It's ultimately, it's money that's held in trust for your retirement. It's really what it's there for. It's a, it's a tax structure, um, which I think is an important thing to understand. So. The money that you have invested in super, it's, it's held there until you meet a condition of release, um, at which point you can access it, and then how you draw down on it is up to you. Um, the fact that it's a, tra a tax structure is really what allows you to decide how your money is invested. So you have control over that. Um, everybody can choose the level of risk they want, the investment strategy they want, um, and what sort of a portfolio they want to invest in to try to build that wealth for their retirement. Um, What's important to understand as well, and I think relatively speaking at this point in time, um, th there's two phases. So you build money into it, so you add through contributions, through earnings, to grow the money, and then when you decide, all right, it's time to retire, I'm done, you move it into pension phase. And there's different tax rules. So in accumulation phase, you're building money um, at, a, at a low tax rate. When you then decide to retire, and it's, so obviously when you retire, you don't have income anymore your superannuation then provides you with that income. Um, how much you have in super will then determine how long it lasts, you still control how it's invested, but in pension phase there's zero tax at all. So there's no tax on capital gains, no tax on earnings, no tax on the income. So the reason it's viewed as a, as a good environment to invest in is that it's low tax in accumulation phase and it's no tax in pension phase. So it is very, very attractive, which it has to be the one that would use it. Um, I'll just quickly touch on the, the types of super funds. This is probably the bulk of us here is we're looking at self-managed funds, industry funds, or retail funds. Um, so your retail funds would be like your MLC, AMP, um, Colonial First Aid, BT. Industry funds are like Australian Super and CBUS. Uh, self-managed super funds, Simona will touch on that a little bit more. That basically is if you want to have a lot more control. Um, in terms of what you invest in. They're, they're significantly more complex and time consuming, but they allow you to buy specific assets. So an industry or a retail fund, you can really just buy managed funds, direct shares, um, a more of a limited type of investments. Whereas if you said, oh, I've got a business and I want, I want my self-managed super fund on the premises that my business operates from, um, a self-managed fund can do that. So a self-managed fund can buy an investment property it can buy business premises that you can then rent to operate your business from. It can buy a work of art. Um, so if you want to buy a Picasso, you can buy it through a self-managed super fund. But there's a very specific rule. You can't hang that on the wall in your living room because you're then benefiting from that investment prior to retirement. So they are more complex and there's a lot of rules. Um, I think Simone would be pretty clear on, on how that works as an accountant. Um, you know, she'd know that you have to appoint a trustee. The trustee is then responsible for everything. And if you stuff it up, you can lose all the tax benefits. So really, really great to have control, but a lot of responsibility. Last one's a constitutionally protected funds. You don't see a lot of them unless um, you're working for the government, I suppose. Um, in you know, state government, there's GESI super funds, which have some specific rules. Probably not really gonna go into that today because I'm 
guessing that nobody is in one of those. If you are and you want to have a chat about it, more than happy to. Um, so what are the rules? Um, well, <laughs> there's a lot of rules. We'll just go on some of the bigger ones that are important. So who's entitled to superannuation guarantee contributions? Well, anybody that's an employee is entitled to that. And I think Simone is a contractor as well in some yes. cases. Yeah. So right. basically, yeah. If, yeah. So, you know, we've got five employees in our office um, and every quarter we have to pay their super contributions. You can pay more frequently, so we actually pay them monthly, but by law, quarterly super contributions have to be paid to our employees. Superannuation is set at 9.5% right now. Maybe going to go up to 12%, maybe not. About that, the budget's coming out in May. It's scheduled to go up 10% this year, or sorry, for next financial year. But then there's talk about the May budget possibly changing that. So not 100% sure, but um, you know, using a, a simple mathematics, if you're on 100 grand a year as a salary, you're getting nine and a half grand paid into your super fund. It's a really important thing to keep in mind because if you're self-employed, you don't have any super contribution um, rules. You basically then become um, discretionary in terms of whether or not you add to super. So if you leave a salary of 100 grand and then go out and self-employed, you make the same 100 grand, you gotta bear in mind you're not getting a nine and a half grand that you were getting paid into super. Um, so self-employed has no contribution rule per se. It's entirely up to you as a, as a discretionary rule. What we tend to find is that people will look at it and go, all right, it's coming into end of financial year. Obviously in WA, the economy's been pretty robust, so people are having, you know, good, good turnover, good revenue, um, possibly high taxable income. So you go, oh, I want to dump some money into super, get a tax deduction, help build my retirement savings. The tricky bit that we find is that when people want to find that lump sum in June, a lot of times they don't have it. They've either spent it, they've stuck it in their mortgage. So a, a little tip that we tend to try to encourage people to do is just start making regular contributions. Um, 200 bucks a week adds up to 10 grand a year. It's a good start. Um, I'll run through the contribution caps in a second, but you'll get to 10 grand if you do 200 bucks a week. You tend to find that it's a lot easier from a cash flow point of view versus finding that 10 grand. And then if you want to top it up because you want to make an additional contribution to reduce your tax further or to add a bit more to your retirement savings, then you can do that heading into the end of financial year. <coughs> so as a self-employed individual, you actually have a lot of discretion um, in terms of how much you add when you add it. So there's, there's a bit more flexibility there, whereas an employee has to be at minimum quarterly, and it's a set amount. Uh, now, having said that, an employee is also then entitled to top up their super. So I'll run through that when we get into the um, contribution rules in a second. Or I've oh, got that written there, don't I? So salary sacrifice um, basically is saying, I'll go back to the person making 100 grand, they get nine and a half grand paid into their super, but they still have surplus cash flow and they want to reduce their tax further, they want to build their retirement savings further. So they can then say, well, in addition to the nine and a half grand that my employer pays in, I'd like, I'd like 10 grand deducted from my annual income and paid into super. So effectively your taxable income drops down to 90 grand. Um, you have an extra 10 grand going into your super that's taxed at 15% instead of your marginal rate, which is probably closer to, would it be 39% or something like that? So you save about 20 cents on the dollar. So there's a tax benefit in doing that. You can then, obviously start to build your super uh, more rapidly and reduce your tax. Um, the personal deductible contribution, so that's what I was saying as a self-employed individual, um, you can dump 10 grand in. The way it works mechanically, um, you deal with your accountant, but you get to the end of financial year, your accountant will say, did you dump anything into super this year? You say, yeah, I put 10 grand in. They'll say, okay, well, you have to lodge a notice of intent to claim a tax deduction with the super fund. So it's basically telling the super fund you're claiming a tax deduction on that 10 grand. Simona gets that back and reduces your taxable income from let's say 100 grand down to 90 because you've contributed to super. Um, without going into a whole bunch of other ones, there are spouse contributions, government co-contributions. There's a lot of little benefits that you could look at as an individual. Um, I think we'd end up going for about two hours if we started going to each one, but broadly speaking today, we wanted to talk about sort of the big ones, which is super guarantee, um, salary sacrifice and personal deductible. So when the money goes into super, if you're claiming a tax deduction on it, or if it's um, done as a super guarantee contribution, it is taxed at 15%. So just keep that in mind. So the higher your taxable income, the higher your marginal tax rate, um, the more beneficial it is because it's capped, that 15% tax is capped. Um, now, when, when can you access it? And how does it work at retirement? I sort of did touch on that. Generally speaking, the preservation age is what they call it. It's reaching the age of 60 and retiring. 
Um, so you can actually access your super before you can get government benefits. So retirement age from, say, Centrelink's point of view, when can I get age pension? That's 67. In terms of accessing your super, it's 60. Um, the issue is that if you have, say, 200 grand in your super and you get to 60 and you say, oh, I'm retiring and I need 100 grand a year, and you have 200 grand, you're going to probably last about two years and then you're out of money. You're 62, you've got nothing in super, and then Centrelink's still going to say you're not getting anything. So um, while you can access it at 60, it doesn't mean that that's your retirement age. If you have $2 million in there, then yeah, you could probably comfortably be able to self-fund your retirement. Um, so there's, when you can access your super, um, but there's when you can afford to access your super to give yourself a comfortable retirement. And then there's when Centrelink will give you money. Whether or not Centrelink gives you age pension will depend on your assets. So at the moment, if you have over a million dollars in, say, super and other investments, excluding your house, Centrelink will say, you're comfortable, you're self-funded, we're not going to give you anything. If, you, if a couple have 500 grand and they're 67, Centrelink will give them uh, a pretty generous pension, not quite the full pension. And that is what you tend to see the bulk of retirees in Australia will have a, you know, a chunk of money in super or some other investments, shares or an investment property, and they get a part pension. So a couple want you know, 60 grand in retirement, they have 30 grand from Centrelink, 30 grand from their own investments, which is quite common, but that's only at 67. Anyone wanting to retire earlier, um, you can access super at 60. If you want to retire at 55, then you need to invest outside of super so that you've got those assets to draw on. Um, will the rules change? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's one thing that I've sort of 15 years into this realized that they will always change. <laughs> so there is, it means you always have to revisit your strategies, revisit what you're doing. Um, how do the rules impact you? Are they good? Are they bad? So everyone worries about super because they go, oh, they're going to change the rules. They're going to change the rules. And they are. But my argument for understanding why it's, it's still worthwhile to look at super is that it has to be a beneficial structure, otherwise nobody will use it. If nobody uses it, everyone relies on age pension, the government goes broke. So they will change the rules a bit, but it will always be a beneficial tax environment to invest through um, because the government needs people to self-fund, otherwise we sort of collectively go broke. Um, in terms of the contributions, so th th they have terrible names for them, but they call them concessional contributions and non-concessional. So concessional, the annual cap's 25 grand. And that's basically salary sacrifice and super guarantee contributions, anything that the tax deduction is claimed on. So if I'm making 100 grand this year and I want to dump 25 grand into my super, I can do that. So that brings my 100 grand salary down to 75 grand. Um, it reduces my tax, builds up my retirement savings. That 25 grand is taxed at 15% instead of my marginal tax rate. So that's the, the common contribution that people want to know a little bit about. Non-concessional is if I sell an investment property or I win lotto or I get an inheritance and I got a chunk of money and I go, well, I don't need it. My mortgage is paid off. I want to set myself up for retirement. I can dump a hundred grand into super. It's after tax money. So the hundred grand stays as a hundred grand. So there's no tax taken out of that. Whereas the 25 grand is reduced to about 21 grand because of the 15% tax that comes out. So there's a couple of rules around that. Um, if the inheritance was big, I can triple the annual cap for the after-tax money. So I can use what's called the bring forward rule. So for 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23, I can use up my 100 grand for each of those years by bringing forward the um, non-concessional contribution. So you can dump in 300 grand, but that means I can't put in the 100 grand the following two years. Um, the 25 grand is an annual cap. That, again, like I said, we're not going to go into tons of detail, but they do have a look back provision now where I can use, if I didn't put in 25 grand last year, then I can use that one to this year and, and the year before as well. So I, in theory, I could put in 75 grand and claim a tax deduction on it this year if I wanted to. Again, if any of these things are relevant to you, we can chat about that in a bit more detail. Um, that cap is scheduled to go up on 1 July by 5%. So I think that brings up to 27 and a half grand. So you'll be able to add a little bit more. Um, the concessional catch-up, oh, sorry, that's what I was talking about, where you can use the previous year's contributions. If you, if you haven't been adding to super and you have a high taxable income this year, you might go, actually, I'm going to dump in a bit more and claim a bigger tax deduction. Uh, a lot of people, especially down here, have a lot of wealth tied up in their house, houses. So they say, look, I don't have a lot in super, but when I retire, I'm going to sell my house and free up some equity out of that and use that to fund my retirement. So the government's actually introduced a downsizer contribution, which effectively allows people over 65 to do that. 
Um, you sell your primary residence, it's 800 grand, you sell it tax free, um, you downsize to a $500,000 property, you can claim or you can contribute the 300 grand, no tax implications into super just to top yourself up. Um, so that's a, a decent option. Then the other one that we see is really beneficial to small business owners um, is a small business CGT concession. Now, Simona can discuss that in further detail, but if you've built up a small business that's worth a fair bit, you can wipe off a ton of tax using that con um, the small business tax concessions. So there's a, there's a range of contributions, um, but again, that's just sort of a broad overview of the most common ones that we tend to see people looking at. Um, a few of the reasons why it's good is that you do have the ability to control the contributions um, and you're very low tax in the earnings um, phase and tax-free in pension phase. So, you know, that's a, obviously an upside. It does create a form of forced savings, particularly for people that are employed. Um, you know, self-employed, as I mentioned, you have discretion over whether or not you add to it. But um, for people that are on a salary, it's forcing them to put money away for their retirement, which generally speaking, they wouldn't otherwise do. I think this COVID year is an interesting one when they allow people to access 10 grand. Um, it gives you a really good idea of what people would do if they could access their super, because the number of people buying boats and jet skis and caravans using their super money was pretty worrying. So the, ben the benefit of having it locked away in a, a, in a you know, restricted access environment is to stop people from doing that. Um, this year is a bit of an anomaly. The, I'll talk about the investment risk because it's important to understand that you have complete control over your super in terms of how, how it's invested, how it performs, and the level of risk and volatility you take. So I'll touch on that in a minute. And it's a protected asset, which I think Simona will touch on a little bit later. But in the event that you have something go catastrophically wrong, or you know, in bankruptcy being the most extreme example, um, you, know, you have the benefit of your super not being assessed in that scenario. Um, Another common thing to, or uh, an item to be aware of is that your superannuation fund can have insurances within it. It doesn't automatically have them, but you can opt to have life and TPD insurance as well as salary continuance. Um, there's pros and cons to it. Um, the upside is that it can be beneficial from a tax point of view, or say my wife and I, when we were just starting out, we had a mortgage, young family, um, pretty limited cash flow, starting a new business. We really needed life insurance for both of us. So we set it up and our super fund paid for our life insurances. The downside is that we were sort of pillaging our retirement savings to you know, fund our life insurances. The upside for us is it didn't come out of our cash flow, so our back pocket didn't have to fund it. So we're now playing catch up and going, okay, well now we're contributing more to super to offset the insurance premiums. But for us, it was really beneficial at that time when we had limited cash flow that we were able to have those insurances through super. But you have to be really careful because the premiums can start to go up. And we've seen situations where people have as much coming out of their super and insurance premiums mm. as they have going in. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not watching it and reviewing it, it's a you know, pretty bad outcome. So you do have premiums that are coming out. Some of them are deductible. Um, so it does give you a tax benefit, but it's something that you really need to review and make sure that it's suitable for you. Doug, what's TPD? For those oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> total permanent disability. So, yeah, good question. Life insurance is really simple. If you die, the lump sum gets paid out as a death benefit to the nominated beneficiary. Um, Claire is going to talk a little bit more about beneficiaries in terms of how super is paid out upon death. Uh, TPD is total permanent disability. So you're permanently disabled, say, in a car accident. Um, you're you know, in a wheelchair and you're going to struggle to go back to your old job. Um, that can include psychological disorders, so anxiety or depression that prevents you from going back to work could have been caused by a work incident yeah um, and that's in insurance is what we're seeing now is insurance premiums are going up a lot um, so it is worth reviewing your insurances but a, a big driver in the increased premiums is the uh, mental health claims so it's very very common now um, some of them are shorter term so you'll have an income protection claim because you've had a an event happen that you've had to take time off work but there are um, you know, longer term claims for mental health issues now, which would fall under total permanent disability. So life and total permanent disability are a lump sum paid out to you for a nominated amount. So you say, I want life insurance for half a million bucks, so it pays off my mortgage. Or TPD, total permanent disability for half a million to pay off my mortgage. Income protection is different. It's a nominated monthly income. So say I want five grand a month. Uh, I'm willing to wait one month before you start paying me, and I want, I want you to pay me for five years. So they're a little bit different in that sense that income protection is a monthly payment for a set period of time. 
whereas life and GPD are just a one-off lump sum. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important to have a look over your insurances and make sure you understand what you've got and whether it's suitable for you. In terms of the risks in superannuation, um, probably the biggest one is investment risk, which I'll, I said I'll touch on a little bit in terms of how, how you control that and what your options are. Um, separation and divorce, so it does fall under um, family tax law, doesn't it, in terms of um, any breakdown in a relationship that your superannuation benefit is taken into account. And diversification, so it's important. any investment strategy, generally speaking, should include diversification. If you look at the sort of simple fundamentals of investing, you diversify. Um, we've seen situations where people set up a self-managed super fund, they own one property in it. There's, a, there's no diversification. Uh, there's a lot of risk in that. It can go incredibly well. If you bought a property in Eagle Bay 40 years ago, and it's a great investment, but there's a lot of risk in that. So um, it, it's really important to review what your investment options are and what level of risk you want. So generally speaking, the asset classes we look at, we've got cash, bonds, property, shares, and private equity. And as you go up the spectrum, the range of volatility will increase. Um, you know, private equity being the highest risk. If I want to put 50 grand into a mate startup company in technology, you know, it could be the best thing ever, but you sort of know that more, more often than not, tech companies don't make it. So it's a risk return side of things. Um, but a diversified portfolio would include you know, any or all of those asset classes, the exposure that you have to them is up to you. So if you're young with a long-term investment time frame, you're not worried about volatility and you're, you want the highest rate of return possible, then you're gonna put more into the property shares and private equity, less in cash and bonds. If you're 65 and about to retire and you're gonna start drawing down on that money, you don't wanna carry that risk. So you start going, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build out the cash and bond side of my portfolio a bit just to reduce that volatility. What we do know about investing is that markets do reward long-term investors. Um, you know, you go back 30 years and you start with a dollar. Um, you invest it in the you know ASX 300, which is the top 300 companies in Australia, and today it's worth 13 dollars, 13.50. That includes dividends being reinvested. Highs and lows the whole way through. If you if you ignore everything in the middle of the graph and you start here and you finish there, that's what's important. Um, but it's the emotional roller coaster of that whole ride that tends to cause the stress and worry for people. Um, you look at the last, oh, what's that, close to 50 years? It is 50 years. Um, the dollar is $69 over a 50 year period. But look at all the events that have happened through that. And that doesn't include COVID. So last year during COVID, the market dropped near on 30%. Um, and it's recovered ridiculously quickly, um, which is great. But you know, the reality is we're going to get through COVID, it'll pass, and in the next few years there'll be some other event that will happen. Maybe we've stimulated the economy too much, and inflation takes off, and then the market crashes because of that. So there's going to be something else. Um, if you're not comfortable with any of that, you don't have to invest your super into growth assets. So you can invest your super in defensive investments like cash and bonds. The consequence of that is that your long-term returns generally lower. Um, what diversification does, it simply smooths out the ride. So your journey is a bit flatter. So if you go and pick three different shares, they're all going to perform differently. They're all going to have different ups and downs, but you blend them together in a diversified portfolio, which generally most super funds do. If you're in a, a diversified managed fund, it just flattens out the peaks and troughs. Um, in terms of what should I do? Some simple things. You, you just review, review your super, review your strategy. Am I adding enough? Um, that depends on you know what your cash flow permits, what your priorities are. Some people will prefer to pay down the mortgage rather than add to super, and that's fine. Um, the consequence of that is you pay a bit more tax. If you pull the money personally, you pay full tax, you pay it on the mortgage. If you add it to super, you pay less tax, but you, you don't have access to that money for quite some time. Um, how's your fund performance? So there's a lot of tools. Um, money Smart's a really good government website that helps you compare different super funds. Um, if you're comparing funds, though, you have to remember that you have to compare apples with apples. So if I'm invested in super and I'm 100% cash, and I compare it to my wife who's 100% shares, they're not apples for apples. So mine's gonna have low return but low volatility. She's gonna have high volatility, high return. So if you're comparing funds and you say, oh, I'm gonna move from that fund to that fund, make sure you're looking at the growth option in both funds or the balanced option in both funds because that's gonna give you the, the most sort of similar comparison between the two. Um, Review if 
it's invested with your risk profile. So what's your time frame? Are you a long-term investor and you're comfortable with risk and volatility and you want to grow your money? Um, you know, or are you getting closer to retirement and you want to have less volatility, a bit more security in your money? Um, again, make sure it's well diversified. Review your fees and expenses. So you'll have an admin fee and an investment fee in super. If you're paying an advisor, you'll have an advice fee. Um, if you've got insurances, you'll have insurance fees. All that adds up. So, you know, fees are important. So have a look over that and see that what you have is suitable uh, or reasonable. And then, yeah, review the, any insurances that you have in there. So that is a crash course on superannuation. I know it's trying to keep it relatively brief and not too detailed in terms of the little nitty gritty things. Happy to answer any questions if anyone's got any. Um, as I said, we'll be here afterwards as well, but um, if not, I'll pass on to Simona, but does anybody have any specific questions? Yeah, in regard to fees, is there a way that we can check um, against you know, what, what should be a standard fee and whether or not what we're paying is above or below that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. It's yeah. changing all the time. Um, what I can say about fees is that they've become a lot more competitive. So it used to be that industry funds were really cheap. The retail funds like um, AMPs and stuff like that were quite expensive. They've lost a lot of money to industry funds, so they're actually dropping their fees to compete. Um, money Smart have um, a bit of a fee calculator. We, like as a, as a business, we've um, subscribed to a software package which allows us to compare any super fund. It's really, really good. Um, but obviously then you have to come pay an advisor to get that review. Yeah. So there are a few tools, um, but generally speaking, um, the admin fee is, it will be a percentage-based fee in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, and then it'll be capped depending on how much you have in there because as percentage-based fees go up, they could just effectively charge you more and more and more as you have more and more wealth. Mm -hmm. So eventually the captain will say, we charge no more than two grand a year to administer your fund. And that, that covers them managing the investments, receiving the contributions, investing it for you, providing your um, annual audit and tax return. So that's, that's what an admin fee and super fund does. Simona, as an accountant, will do that for a self-managed super fund, so she'll do the tax return for the fund. So self-managed super funds have um, a fee schedule as well, and um, that, again, depends on you know, how complex it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Money Smart is probably a good starting point. Every super fund that's a, like a retail or an industry fund has to have a product disclosure statement. Mm -hmm. They're brutally painful to read through, <laughs> like 100 pages, and it's so um, mind-numbingly hard to understand everything. So it is a little bit difficult, um, but generally if you do a bit of research, you can you can compare products. And I think CanStar had a, a comparison tool as well that was reasonable for that. Mm -hmm. um, so then you can compare your admin fees. Then there's the investment fee. So when they then give the money to Vanguard to invest in a diversified high growth fund, Vanguard says, well, we charge a fee to decide, mm -hmm. well, not to decide, but to buy the shares and to manage that. So they have the admin fee from the super fund to do the you know, we run the account for you and we, we deal with the audit tax return. Then you have the person investing the money saying, well, we also charge a fee to get your money into the markets or into the bond portfolio, whatever you want. So both those things are pretty clearly outlined in, and um, in the PDS, which like I said, is terrible to read. Uh, most super funds now do send uh, a member their annual audit and tax mm -hmm. return. And it is more often than not now fairly clearly outlined in that because um, there's just so much pressure on these super funds to have transparency and disclosure. Mm -hmm. So where 10 years ago it would just be in the fine print or even not, not written at all, nowadays you'll generally see, you know, your opening balance on this day was this, your contributions were this, your earnings were this, your fees for admin, your mm -hmm. fees for insurances, your fees for investment were this. So typically you'll find that they're pretty well outlined nowadays, um, mm -hmm. certainly not perfect and sometimes hard to compare, but there, there are a fair few tools online that you can use to help do that. Um, it's not a perfect solution. And like I said, for a, a, us as a business, we pay a fair bit of money to subscribe to software that does that specifically for us so that we can um, do very detailed comparisons. The other thing is when you're doing a comparison on the returns through different super funds, they are showing you measured fees. So that's all apples to apples. So you're not then going to have one who's who's mm. going to go on top of that charge a big amount and one who's going to charge a small amount. That's what you would get if you had paid all the fees to them already. So okay. when you're doing that comparison of you know X percentage per year for mm. each fund, that's all where you'd be measuring. Okay. Mm. So just 
understand better and have a look. Mm. And just in terms of some of the points that folks made, because I've just done this. Um, so I had my money, a little bit of money in the super. I then went overseas and worked and completely forgot about it. I then come back and found it. And for some bizarre reason, because I was relatively young when I left, they had put me in something that was pretty much all cash and bonds, oh. which is normally what you would do when you're getting towards retirement age. Oh. So instead of earning the, I think most other funds averaged about 8% while I was away, mine averaged 2.5%. Oh no. <laughs> So there's your uh, lesson in making sure you review it regularly. Yeah, look at what you have. The, the ATO has a portal to help you track down lost super. Yeah. And we've found, you know, people with six super funds. They have all sorts of insurance. They have premiums coming up. It's not invested properly. So you can consolidate them. Yeah. Um, then you, you control how that's invested because you'll find, like Steph, you might have it invested improperly. Mm -hmm. they in, if it's inactive, they might cancel your insurances. I have one client who's had terrible health issues. He had five super funds that had guaranteed insurances, like default insurance he put in. Mm -hmm. So he's kept five super funds because if he applied for life insurance, nobody would give it to him. But his default insurances through these employer funds that he had, basically when the fund was set up, they said, we'll give you a hundred grand of insurance, no questions asked. So he's kept all those. So he's had to keep five super funds. It's an administrative nightmare, oh but he can't get insurance otherwise. So there's all sorts of Things that we don't go into today because you could talk for hours about little innuendos and s different scenarios. Um, but and also comparing performance. If you do that, please look at the long-term performance. Yeah. If you start comparing, you know, six-month performance or one-year performance, it's it's very rare for an asset manager to continually outperform the market. Some do, and they might be the ones that you want to look at the long-term performance of them. But if somebody beats the market in one year and they get a 12% return when the market does eight, you need to know that they're going to do that on a recurring basis. So look at five, seven, 10 year performance. If someone's doing really well over a 10 year time frame, then you know, that's generally what we would view as a more credible um, long-term investment strategy. I just quickly, I'm really interested in um, spouses and whether you build into, as part of your advice, spouses having roughly equal super uh, contributions or balances regardless of who is earning income or, or yeah, what have you. Okay. Is that something that you discuss with them? I'm, and I'm going to talk 100%. briefly about family law and yeah, separate so what happens. There's a lot of stuff in there. So it depends if if you're both on similar <coughs> incomes, like say you have a business with a family trust that distributes income out and both partners get a hundred grand, then yeah, you definitely look to... Yeah, so I'm talking more about that traditional FIFO scenario where yeah. the, uh, yeah, the mum's so at home looking after kids, she's sacrificed her career and the, and the dad is earning bucket loads and has 500,000 in super at the age of 40. Yeah, you can do. It's it's a bit hard in that sense because the FIFO husband's got a half million because he's on a high salary and the stay at home, it depends if they have surplus cash flow. Generally yeah. then we tend to see people wanting to you know, use their surplus to pay off the mortgage. Yeah. The partner will have the half million yeah. He'll nominate his spouse as the yeah. beneficiary, so if he dies, she gets the money. Um, Claire's going to talk a little bit more about that. Where it becomes really, really relevant, though, is, and I didn't go into the detail about it, again, just to try to in, in sort of do the time. If you get near, there's a transfer balance cap. So if you have 1.6 million in super, that's the most that you can move to pension phase. So if you remember, I talked about accumulation phase and pension phase. You're limited in terms of what you can put into pension phase at a cap of $1.6 million. Oh. So where it becomes really relevant is if we have a client, say, with the, the husband's accumulated $2 million in his super and the, his partner was stay at home raising the kids, we'd probably look at pension phase to pull four hundred grand out of his super and start getting it into a super fund for his spouse. Because he can only put one point six into pension phase and have that 100% tax-free. If we can then get some money into the partner's fund, then we can start a second pension for them and have that fully tax-free as well. So it does become very relevant, but where it's, where it's a high income earner and a stay-at-home partner, it, we, we find it something that comes up and people want to see some sort of balance in it, but it's, there's not a lot of tax benefit in doing it. So it <laughs> yeah, doesn't- not, after, Especially not for the man, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's after tax earnings, so yeah. the, the husband would have paid tax at mm -hmm. the highest rate, and mm -hmm. then it's the after-tax contribution, which is, when it goes into the super fund, it's not taxed because it's already been taxed, so it's non-concessional. Mm -hmm. um, but whether people then do that, mm -hmm. you know, if you're on a package of say, you know, two hundred thousand, you can contribute for your spouse, but not many people do that. No, yeah. sadly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's pretty limited. Like spouse contributions are three grand, and you get a five hundred and forty dollar tax offset. So. 
there's not a lot of government incentive to dump money into a spouse's super. Yeah. There's other things you can do that you can do contribution splitting. So I can put 25 grand into my super, claim a tax deduction on it, and after the financial year, I can have it transferred to my wife's. Oh. There's rules like that, mm. which you can do. There's pros and cons. Oh. It, it can allow you to access government benefits I in a different way. So yeah. there's, again, they're, they're sort of more complex strategies, but typically where we see what you're talking about, Claire, is, is people with high, high net worth that um, can only put the 1.6 million into pension phase and go, well, I'm better with my, using my partner's unused super, dumping everything that we can into there. So mm. that an, an ideal scenario if for very wealthy people couple is to each have 1.6 million in pension. Yeah. That's it. That's nirvana. No tax. Um, tons of money. Uh, <laughs> very, very simple. Um, but it seems like tons of money, but, it, really but it doesn't last that long. If, you, if you're retiring <laughs> for 20 years, you know, that's not a lot of money for 20 years to survive. It, well, it, de it depends on what you want. So like somebody coming in with 3 million bucks, if they want Then is uh, inflation as well. So 
It's all well and good to retire now, but if inflation takes off, then um, you have to take that into account as well. That you know, somebody getting 60 grand a year right now might need 120 grand to have the same level of income in 20 years' time. Cool. All right, so today is more about, from my point of view, about superannuation and businesses. So I'm going to show of hands how many of you here are business owners. I'm guessing all of you. Good. Um, how, how do you feel about your superannuation and how do you feel about your wealth management? Do you feel that you've got it sorted or do you not know enough to then be comfortable? What's the consensus? I'm going to ask about one year. I'll last about a year. Oh no. Yeah, before I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and do you think it's because as a business owner you don't know where you're going, you don't know how much profit you have, you don't know what your cash is? It's not like you're going to work and you get paid regardless. Yeah. You have to work for your money and then you are responsible for then managing it. Is that the biggest challenge everyone's mm -hmm. facing? So the problem with humans is we're not very good at managing our money generally. Look, even, you know, I've been doing this for decades and I still struggle as well. I need to have a plan in place to force me to do it. So my, I guess my message to the business owners is have a think about your business, but also think of it in, in three, sort of three areas of your life. You've got your business, you've got your personal life, and then you've got your wealth. So all three of them need to work together. So the business needs to make enough money to support you to live, but you also need to think about the wealth later because you can't, you can't just live this high life and then end up in retirement with nothing. So, so over time, you start to look at that flow. You look at the business, how much money is it making? How much can you contribute to your household? And what is that budget? And then how much can you contribute into your retirement planning and into your wealth management? Your superannuation is just one part of it. A lot of the businesses that we look after, super is, is a given. I think everyone needs to be putting money into super, but you've also got wealth management. So you might have a business that makes a lot of money. You put some of it into super, because the, the downside of super is you can't take the cash out. So it's not a liquid asset. And then you also put some money into investments and, and, and other areas so that you're protected, I guess. You're not just exposing your business and your life to to losing it all. So my my uh, focus today is on the business side of things and how how the business is risky and what are we actually doing to protect ourselves as business owners in the future. Um, this is just a quick quote in case people don't know what compounded returns are. Who, who doesn't know what that is? Okay, so when you when you invest and super fund is a compounded return strategy. You put money in and you keep putting money in. It then creates more wealth because it's invested in assets that create income, interest, dividends, uh, trust distributions, etc. That income then gets reinvested and it just keeps going and going and going. So a little bit of money over a long period of time creates a lot of wealth. So that's what compounded returns are. And it's almost like making money from nothing. If you, if you invested in an index fund, say, 20 years ago, that money keeps growing and growing and growing. And it's like a hockey stick. It just keeps growing over time and you're doing nothing to create that wealth. And that's why superannuation is such a good vehicle because you're not working as such to make those returns. Um, okay. We get a lot of business owners that start young, don't think about their super, until they start to get to about my age. We find it's usually around the mid 40s, early 50s, that sort of range, where you go, oh my God, I've got no retirement <laughs> planning, what am I doing? And this is the impact of that happening. As a business owner, you need to think about this in the future. If you started young and you put money aside religiously into your super, that's a hockey stick event, a compounded return scenario there, where by the time you get to 67, you would have 1.2 million in your retirement savings. If you started at 41, you have a quarter of that, that money. And this is the real impact of not focusing on your superannuation and your wealth management. It, it is, it's quite shocking when you see sometimes the younger generation who, who don't think about their future, by the time they retire, there won't be a pension, a government 
pension, and they need, they need to think about that. I've put in some figures in here, we don't need to run through this, but it's just to give you some scenarios to show you how much you can end up with in your super fund, so the accumulated value, um, over you know, many, many decades. If you started at 21 versus 31, 41, 51. So the amount of money you end up with at the end can vary significantly based on when you started, how much you put in, and also the return structure that you get back out of it as well. But there's four scenarios, and you can look at it later, but essentially it's just showing you how much you're contributing each year based on your income levels and what you end up with. Um, so someone earning, you know, in the highest bracket who's contributing 25000 a year would end up, if they started at 21, would end up with $5 million in their in their uh, super fund, which obviously at today's value is about 1.7. Go away and have a look at it. It gives you a feel for what you can do with, with money and investment over, over a long period of time. The super funds are taxed, obviously, so that's why there's fees and taxes in there. Um, but you can see pretty clearly that it's an easy way to put money in, it earns a return, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing over time. Okay, so this is the main area I want to focus on today. There are different, uh, I guess, requirements for superannuation if you're an employer. Who here has staff and employees? No? How many of you have put yourself on wages in your business? One, two. How, okay, if, are you sole traders or are you trusts or companies? Sole traders. Sole traders, okay. So with sole traders, you can't employ yourself. So you can't be an employee for yourself, which means that you're required to make your own superannuation contributions from your profit, I guess, your business profit. So you can claim that as a tax deduction. So you said you're required to, you're not required to. Though, you're not required. Yeah. So what I mean is, because yeah. you, you can't That's pay yourself the wage, got, yeah. you can only contribute as yeah. a personal contribution. Yeah. Um, and what that means is, you know, you, you're, you might be a sole trader and you, let's say you're earning 100000 a year profit. It then is up to you how much you contribute into your super because there's absolutely no legal requirement for you to do that. If you put yourself on the payroll, so quite often businesses that are trusts or companies, they put their, themselves on the payroll and it forces them to pay the wages, the tax and the superannuation. And we always advise business owners to do that. Because, yeah. I was going to say, do you agree with Doug that a good place to start is $200 a week if you've not oh, been doing definitely. anything? So when I said before, there are three parts of your life. You've got your business, your personal and your wealth. You need to do a budget to see how much it costs to live. If that budget is, say, 70000 a year, you only take out of the business 70000 a year. Then you look at what's left and then you have the choice to move some of it into wealth, which is superannuation or personal investments. If you don't know what your personal budget is, you're kind of lost because you're spending all your money in the business, you're mixing it all with personal and you know life, and then you get to the end of the year, like Doug said, and you've got nothing left to pay into your super. So what you should do is do a budget for your, for your home and your life and say, well, I need 1500 a week to live, to pay my mortgage, to pay the bills and everything. That's all I'm going to take out of the business. Leave everything in, in the business. Then you look at the business and say, well, you know, I should have some money left at the end of the year. How much of that can I then put into super? And then once you've worked that out, you yeah, set up a direct debit, whatever you need to do to move the money out of the business. But what you should not do is mix business and, and personal because that's where everyone gets caught out. They end up, you know, buying assets, they end up, you know, buying investment properties, they end up buying cars and, and before they know it, there's, there's literally nothing left. To, to manage, and that's not good planning. Um, so, so yeah, with superannuation for employees, you are required to pay that, like Doug said, every quarter. The trick with superannuation is if you do not pay it on time, if it's not paid by the, 20, by the 28th after the quarter end, you can't claim it as a tax deduction. You can go through the process and try and claim it through the ATO, but there are penalties and interest. So we see this all the time. Businesses, they have staff, they don't pay their super. 
we then do the tax return at the end of the year and they've just lost all of this deduction because they have not been disciplined enough to pay it on time. So our advice is, again, work out a budget to see how much you need to pay with super for employees and for personal and then pay that regularly. Do the pay run, pay your staff, pay the super straight away. Don't leave it until three months later, oops, got no money, can't pay it. I think Doug touched on contractors and I yes, had and a situation where I was contracting yep. to a company and they, or the, an American company, they paid me super that I wasn't expecting. It made me wonder whether or not my contractors then have I got an obligation to them to yes. be paying them super. Generally, if you've got, if you're hiring people predominantly for their labour, mm -hmm. so you're paying them by the hour or by the day or by the month or whatever it is, and they're turning up to work and just providing labour, so they're not providing tools, they're not providing machinery, their own equipment, they're basically an employee. There, there's not much difference between that contractor and an employee, and you are required to pay the super. Mm -hmm. So what we say to, to, to businesses is when you agree the fee with the contractor, make sure in the contract it states that the fee includes superannuation. Mm -hmm. And then you take out the super and you pay it separately. And you get caught out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I can just hire lots of contractors and get away with not paying super. What we find is they end up paying a higher rate to the contractor, because normally contractors charge more. Mm -hmm. And then the ATO comes back and says, oh, well, where's the super? You get a penalty and you've got to pay the super on top. So it is worth looking at your staff and doing it properly and making sure that if they are contractors, you take that 9.5% out of the fee and then pay it straight to the ATO. Yeah. It's quite rife down in New South Wales. That happens a lot. Mm. There are lots of businesses that hire contractors because they think it's cheaper and actually it's, pro it's probably not cheaper. Mm. Yeah. When you factor in you know, you've still got to pay their insurances half the time, their workers' comp, and all the rest of it, and yeah, you're paying a higher rate per hour. So yeah, there is a little t uh, calculator on the ATO website. Okay. Uh, so go to the ATO website and search for contractor versus employee. It asks you about 10 questions, mm -hmm. and then you, you'll see if it, they are a contractor. Nine times out of 10, they are. Okay, so tax savings, I'll quickly run through the tax savings in the next slide. Doug's already talked about the catch-up contributions. The reason why catch-up contributions are really important for businesses is because businesses generally have cyclical income. You have a really good year, lots of profits, and then you'll have a not so good year. So in the times when things are good, think about doing a catch-up because there are tax benefits to that. As most of, the, most of you are sole traders, you don't have much opportunity to minimise your tax. Because most of the tax planning and tax minimisation that happens is usually with trusts and companies. And the reason being is because a sole trader is taxed on their profit and there's no way you can shift that profit around. So with a trust, for example, you might have a family, so a husband and wife that, that run a business the profit is normally split between the two of them. When you're a sole trader, you can't really do that. And if you end up in a situation where you are a trust and you've got quite a lot of profit, which has happened a lot recently with, with COVID, because they've received JobKeeper, they've received cash flow boost, they've ended up with a lot of profit, this is a good year to start contributing into super because you may not end up with that much income in, in the following years. Wealth protection is another one, and Doug mentioned it earlier. If you, if you think your business is your lifeline, think again. You know, normally with businesses, you have a catastrophic event in your business somewhere between seven and 10 years. And what that means is your business is going fine, and then something happens, and you can lose a business quite quickly. Most people think that they are investing everything into their business, they don't need to worry about their wealth management. They don't need to worry about putting money aside. What happens when you lose the business? You've lost everything. So with, with businesses, wealth is even more important because you're not guaranteed a paycheck. So wealth protection, the reason why superannuation is so uh, 
so beneficial is because if your business does collapse and you lose your home, you lose your investment property, you lose everything, you're super safe. And we see that a lot. A lot of businesses that do fail, they then, you know, years later say, thank God we had super because they have nothing left. And, and it is a common thing. It's not, people think it doesn't happen to them, but it does. <laughs> it happens a lot. Self-managed super for, for business premises. As Doug mentioned, you can buy your business the premises in a self-managed super fund, but again, you are putting all your eggs in one basket. There are benefits to it because obviously you're paying a mortgage on that property that you're eventually gonna own. So it's not like you're paying rent and it's dead money. But if something were to happen to that building, if something were to happen to you and you can't run that business anymore and you then have to lease that property, you may end up with not getting any rent for a while and then suddenly that is not a good, good investment. And you may struggle to sell it. There are all sorts of complexities with owning property as an investment. So I think twice before you do that and look at all the options, run the numbers to make sure you, you know that it's a, a more viable option than just paying rent. Um, just quickly on self-managed, we advise clients that unless they have close to a million in their super, don't bother, bother with the self-managed super fund because it's far too expensive. The fees involved in managing, the compliance involved, is far too great for most people, unless you've got quite a lot of wealth. So we see lots of people who set up self-managed super funds sort of 10 years ago, and they have a tiny little investment property in it, and it probably makes them 20,000 a year, and it's just not effective. The rent they're making, is not enough to pay the mortgage half the time because they've got obviously debt and then they've got to pay fees, they've got to do all the compliance. At the end of it, they might end up with a you know one percent return on that on that investment, which is obviously far lower than if they invested in a industry fund or yeah, one of the main retail super funds. So not always a good idea to think about self-managed super. If you're gonna go into it, get really good advice and plan it out. Because uh, it can bite you in, in the bum quite quickly. Okay. We've already touched on this with the personal contributions. All, my only message there is just because you're running a business doesn't mean you can't put money into super. You can. And make it part of your plan. Pay yourself a fixed wage, including the super. And it is a tax deduction. That's a quick table showing you the tax benefits of contributing into super. When you are a sole trader, those are the tax rates that you need to think about. So there's you know those five lines and that's the tax rate in the second column. As you can see, the tax rate for <coughs> sole traders and individuals is very high. So a company, for example, pays tax at 26% flat. Most individuals will pay far more tax. Hence why a sole trader is not a, a, it's not a tax effective structure for a business um, and you are far better capping your tax rate or doing some tax planning to reduce that tax and one of the ways you do that is contributing into super. So you, as you can see, if you're in the higher bracket, so 120 to 180, your, your highest, um, your, the highest bracket has an effective tax rate of 39 because it's 37% tax plus 2% Medicare, so you're paying tax at 39%. If you're contributing money into super, that money is only taxed at 15, so you're saving 24%. And there's a little example there to show you if someone was to contribute the 25,000, how much would they save in tax? You can read it later, but essentially on their tax return, they'd save 10,000 tax just by contributing that in. The super fund would obviously pay tax at 15% on the contribution, but the net effect is 6,000. So effectively the ATO gets 6,000 less from you. That 6,000 can be used in your super fund to grow it, um, and it's your wealth, it, it's your money that you're then going to get at, at retirement. So there is a benefit to contributing into, ta into super, and it's usually tax driven, as you can see in the example. And even if it's not 25 grand, even if it's 10 grand, you're still probably saving a couple of grand in tax. 
Is there a, so. a limit to what you can get? Yeah, yeah. Is it there is, yes. you can only get those systems? Okay. Yeah, so there is. So there's two limits. So Doug mentioned the superannuation contribution caps in his little table. Yeah. So it's 25,000 per year. You can obviously do the catch up for five years, so up to 125,000. There is also, with individuals, if you're an employee and you're earning more than roughly 260,000 a year, it means your superannuation on that is more than 25,000. As soon as you go over the 25,000, there is an additional tax. It's called Division 293 tax. But is there a limit to, say, if you earn whatever in the second bracket, that you could get the lower, you know, can you put as much money out of your income? No, so it's only 25,000. So let's say you had a profit of, say, 150,000. Technically, you can't, yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't do that forever. <coughs> it's 25000 per year unless you're doing a catch-up. Yeah. Um, if you sell a business, you can because you're then using the CGT concessions, the capital gains tax concessions, to use that gain to then put it into super. But, yeah, generally it's a 25000 And we always advise clients when we do tax planning, uh, we say max out that cap, 25 k each every year, um, to make sure that they're getting the, the tax benefit. Can I clarify, is that 25000 yep. that to get the benefit? Or can you put in more, but you won't get the benefit for only 25000 Yeah, no. So any more is taxed at the at an additional tax. So, so you can put in more. You can put more in, yeah. um, but you, you then get taxed extra. So it's Division 293 tax, and it's essentially another 15% tax on top. Yeah. So let's say you've contributed 40000 The first 25000 is fine because it's going into the super and then the additional amount you get taxed, not the super fund. So you'll end up with a notice from the tax office and you end up paying that 15% tax. It'll often just end up, like if you put 40 grand in and you claim the 25 grand as a deduction, the other 15 is generally taxed at your marginal rate. So it's just like you put in after tax yeah. money. Yeah, it's like you're paying the ATM. Yeah, so you don't get you don't get a tax benefit on it, you just pay your normal, um, your normal marginal tax rates on that. So it, yeah, it doesn't really give you the tax benefit, but it gets the money into that plan. Yeah. Um, that's just quickly explaining how tax works in super. I've got to be quick because I've got to wrap it up. Um, when it's contributed into the super, it is generally taxed at the 15% unless it's after tax contribution because essentially you've got to pay tax on either in or out. That's the way the ATO sees it. Um, the, the fund is actually taxed at 15% as well. So when it's earning income, so rent, dividends, all the rest of it, it's taxed. Then when you withdraw the tax, the when you withdraw the money out of the super fund, it's generally tax free if you're in the retirement phase. You can draw money out before that if there are circumstances that allow you to do that, and you you do get taxed on that, and it's generally twenty two percent, but it does it does depend. Um, we've talked about this already. The, the only message I'll, I'll just quickly talk on uh, this is when you sell a business, you pay tax on that sale. So let's say you're, you're a sole trader and you sold your business for half a million, you will pay tax on that. It, is get, it gets reduced down using the CGT concessions, but another way to really reduce your tax is to put some of it into super. So that's why it's relevant for business owners. And that's it. So we'll just... Ask Claire to come up and yes, give please. a bit of a legal um, side of things, just so that you have that um, perspective as well. If you do need to go, please feel yeah, free. Yeah, no need to go. Um, I'm but Claire that. will give us just five minutes on um, the legal perspective on a couple of things we've touched on today, and then um, they'll all be around after if you'd like to ask some more questions. So, quick question: Who here has a wheel? Hand up if you've got a wheel. Okay, so about fifty percent are there. Because it's actually quite a very young audience. So, most people assume when they make a will that when they're saying how they want their estate to be given away or distributed, that it, it includes your super. But it doesn't actually. The reason it doesn't is because when you make a will, um, you can only give away assets and interests that you own, and you don't actually own your superannuation. 
That was a huge shock to me when I first learned that. But technically, it is the trustee of the super fund that owns the super, and that's why a will generally doesn't deal with superannuation. So when you're doing your estate planning, you've got to work out how you're going to give your estate away through your will. You've also got to have a consideration for how you want to give your superannuation away, if you have any, when you die. So wills will generally deal with super in one of two ways. They'll either say nothing about super, or they'll say, if there is leftover super that hasn't been given away through the super fund, then I want it to join in my estate and be distributed in accordance with your with my will. Does anyone here that has a will, do they know, just generally speaking, how their will deals with super? Probably one of those two options. So on a person's death, the trustee of the super fund has to determine who will distribute the funds to. And how much discretion the trustee has really depends on your super fund and the policy. And broadly speaking, the trustee is guided by or bound by nominations that the person has made while they're alive. So has everybody here made nominations? Or it's to put it the other way, is there anyone here that's not made a nomination on their super fund as to who they want the benefit to go to if they died? Well, I thought that was just part of the start of the superannuation fund. You had, a, you had to nominate your beneficiary almost uh, at the get-go. It depends on the fund. They might not require you to do that at the start. So when I look at clients, often in our meetings, we go into their super fund online and we see they haven't nominated anyone at this point or they've nominated someone 20 years ago, an ex-boyfriend or a mum that might have passed away or what have you. So there's generally two main types of nominations, binding and non-binding nominations. Does everyone know about these? Or does anyone know if they've made a binding or a non-binding nomination? So a binding nomination generally has to be renewed every three or so years if it's to remain binding. It's binding that it removes the discretion of the trustee when the trustee is deciding who to give the funds to. Um, it's, it can be a little bit cumbersome administratively. Often that form that you fill out needs to be witnessed by a lawyer or a JP. And if, you per if a person forgets to renew it, you know, say every three years or whatever the rule is according to that fund, it becomes non-binding. Um, then the, the non-binding nomination is the one that most people do. It's usually done online, so you can just go onto your um, fund electronically, state who you want your um, benefit to go to. It doesn't have to be renewed. The catch is the trustee res retains a residual discretion as to who it's going to give the funds to. Um, it's also possible in the case of some super funds, rather than nominate a beneficiary, is to actually say that you want your um, fund to join your estate and be distributed in accordance with your will. So what do I recommend to clients that come to see me? With spouses, you know, just your average mum and dad, I normally recommend that they just nominate each other through a non-binding nomination. Um, obviously that's very general advice, um, but it normally just brings that super decision in line with what's happening with the will, and then when one spouse dies, the other will then need to nominate a new beneficiary under their super fund, which is often the children in equal shares, that's your classic situation. Where there is an option to nominate um, that your super joins in your estate and is distributed in accordance with the will, then I almost always recommend this option. And the reason is twofold. Um, wills are much more complex documents than um, super nominations generally, so you're able to account for a range of situations, such as um, if X dies and it goes to Y, but if Y has already died and has kids and it goes to Z, um, whereas a super nomination form doesn't allow for all those scenarios. And secondly, the reason why I think it's sometimes better, off, usually better to distribute an estate in accordance with the will is wills are often far less, um, well, generally speaking, uh, more difficult to be challenged than a um, trustee's um, exercise of discretion. So that's a little bit about wills. Now, just a tiny bit about family law. So starting with de facto couples, in WA, Super is an asset that can be divided if parties separate, but only if you are legally married. Yeah, I know. This is just a WA thing. There's so much money behind here. So if you're a de facto and you separate, you cannot split and divide that asset. And this is what I was talking about, that so common situation down here where you've got the FIFO partner, 
um, worked in huge um, income, huge super contributions, and then you've got the mum who has fallen off her normal career trajectory to look after the kids and have, have very much super. If they separate, they cannot move some of the super from his fund over into her fund. So most of my friends, including myself, we're all de facto's. Um, and as you know, 50% of long-term relationships end. It actually, I should take this advice myself, but it would be better <laughs> off if we were married just for the purposes of that risk that we might separate one day. So there is legislative reform in place to try and bring WA in line with the rest of the states, but because it's, it's, it's a massive disadvantage mm -hmm. to women over men, it's just it's, it's the slowest law reform happening we've ever seen. Sorry, can I have a <laughs> What if... Um